Let's bow our heads, folks. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we could be here today together. We thank you for the opportunity to study your word. And Lord, we pray that there is a blessing upon it. Help us to understand the book of Revelation. Help us to understand the ministry of Jesus in the heavenly courts above. Lord, give us the knowledge, the retentiveness, that we may understand and have the capacity to pass it on, to help others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, just a little bit, a few of the important things there, obviously, from last week. It is the book of Revelation. It really is the revelation of Jesus Christ, not the revelation of John. He was only a medium, if you like. I understand. Okay, he was only passing on. Which God gave to which God gave him to show his servants. So it came from the Father to the Son, and it's about things that must shortly take place. Shortly, in terms of angelic language, is whenever. Not a long time. If you understand the duration of their presence and existence, when we talk about a few thousand years, which the foreknowledge of God had that it would take, shouldn't have been though the intent was for a much shorter time if the apostolic church had really really snowballed and kept going Jesus would have returned the work would have been finished and I don't know where we would be we wouldn't be God's foreknowledge it's a horrible thought isn't it mm. I'm glad it failed because I'm here now and you're here, you understand. It's hard, it's a great concept. So when somebody asks you, it's very hard. Tonight is really about ask questions when you have them and start thinking, how can I pass this on to someone else? Yeah? That's what it's about. So, unlocking Revelation, bless it, and I'll just repeat this. And I'll do that a few times till everybody knows this word, this verse by heart. Blessed is he or she who reads and those who hear the words of the prophecy. So it's not just to read. It is not just to hear, but also it is to keep the things that are written in it. And then you have seven times that expression. The time is near. There is emphasis. Now when you bear in mind that the book of Revelation was written not just for the Jews, and it was, I'm sorry, uh, the, the early Christian church, and it was, but the interesting thing is it was particularly written more than half of Revelation. Any from chapter 12 and onwards is written for the people that are living in the end time and we are in the latter part of that end time yeah oh yes oh yes sometimes when you study those prophecies it's almost frightening how close it actually is it's very close so, this title, the book of Revelation, tells you immediately one thing. The charts that Revelation is a sealed book and, and not be understood is completely, totally, totally false. Yeah? It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is to be understood. Unlike some portions of the book of Daniel, 600 years before, they were kept right to the end time. But, a lot of Daniel, the bulk of it, was really meant for the Jewish people, too. But, and the book of Daniel, which we will refer to very often, and the book of Revelation, as you know, are sister, sister books. Always remember that. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, the revelation about Christ... If you want to understand or ever explain to another person 
what Jesus is doing in the heavenly course. You see, my concept of the activity of Jesus in, uh, as he went back to heaven uh, as a Calvinist Protestant was always, he's done his work now and you can ask him things. And I never had the picture that he was fully employed in the salvation process in the restoration of, of mankind. It is, it is a wonderful thing to learn. When I came to this church, this church taught me Jesus is really, may I use the word, doing overtime? Ongoing. Ongoing. No lunch breaks. I'm only kidding. But you understand what I'm saying? Jesus is really working for our restoration. And there's a doubling now since the judgment. So, okay, we'll talk about that another time. It reveals Jesus in his heavenly work after the ascension. That is when his work continued. Continued. Remember the... Remember the, uh, remember that the courtyard, in the courtyard, representing the what? The world. The world. In the courtyard, you have the altar of? Incense. That's a sorry. Mercy. Mercy. If it wasn't for the apple crumble, I'd send you out. All right? Order of, in, order of sacrifice? Yes, yes, very good. Very signifying what? That's what I wanted to say. Yeah. 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 Calvary, Calvary. That's it, that's it. And that had to happen in this world. Mm -hmm. So the sin, forgiveness for the sin is dealt with in the courtyard at this planet. Then the priest goes on your behalf in the holy place. You can't go there. What is that holy and most holy place? What did that represent? God. Judgment. You're not wrong, but that's sanctuary. Not a sanctuary. What century? Heavenly. <sighs> He's coming to us. That proper building temple proper, where you couldn't go with only the priest. Who is the priest foreshadowing? Jesus. Jesus. Yeah, where did Jesus go when he left his place? Heaven. Heaven. To do what? To intercede on earth. To intercede. He's doing ministration for you. That's the equal to the in the typical, when the priest goes into the holy place, I want you to have that picture. Once you have that picture, it becomes plain. He goes for you to the holy place to intercede. Intercede for what? Yes, yes. 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 So, I want you to understand something. The sins are forgiven where? In the courtyard. In the courtyard. So he's not going there for your sins that you have committed because that's dealt with in the courtyard. What does a Christian have to do before a Christian can be acceptable to born God? Again. Born again. As the Hebrew would say, born from above. Well, that's the work that Jesus is doing for you. So, the sins are being dealt with. It's the sinfulness that has to be dealt with. And that happens with the intercession in heaven by Christ. Yeah? And then later on, indeed, the second phase is the judgment. Okay? But I want you to have that picture. It helps. It helps. So, the plan of redemption is what he is working on for each and every soul. Revelation was given to guide, comfort, strengthen the church, not only in his day, but throughout the Christian era to the very close of time. If ever there was a book written for us, this is it. And remember, I showed you this actually last week. The theme is the great controversy. It's all about Jesus and Satan. You know, when you look at this world, you look at the Middle East. So pick any country. You have players that are not getting their hands dirty. 
fueling the various parties in the conflict because they want to extend their influence over this territory. There are economic considerations and strategic benefits. Do you understand? And they don't care how much killing is done. They just keep sending and supplying the arms for hoping that their side might do all the killing or enough of the killing to claim victory. Mm -hmm. Satan is like that. He doesn't care. He supplies all your needs if you want to be bad. It's no problem. It's no problem. That's his influence. Now Jesus has done everything to supply you with your needs. And one of those needs is his intercession in the heavenly sanctuary. Get that? Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Let's talk about the seven churches. We're not going to go through all of them. I mean, we're just going to mention them. And I'm just, I don't want to give you too much information. But just enough to make it worthwhile, come here and have some... We don't have any soup, have we? Yeah. Maria, where yes. are you? Okay. Yes. Greeting the seven churches. When we talk about the seven churches, the first thing you have is a salutation. I like that. It's a nice style. We've actually dealt with what we call the prologue, which is the foreword. Understand that? Okay. Which are in Asia? Now, if I asked you where is Asia? Turkey. It's very good. It's very good. I thought Asia was Vietnam, Thailand, yeah. Myanmar, Philippines, Philippines yeah. India. Cambodia. See, yes, you got them. See, this is the, this is the, what shall I say, uh, Roman province of Asia, which we call Asia Minor, which is really west of Asia. It involves a territory, and I'll show you, it involves a territory here, where the seven are listed, and I'll mention them again in a minute, of about 300 from west to east and about 250 from north to south that's about the area and that was the Roman province of Asia so when they talk about Asia in the Bible they're not talking about China okay we're talking about actually you had it correct Turkey Eastern Turkey and maybe a little bit beyond yeah okay now you have a list here, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Can you see they are in a shape? Because these are the seven churches we're going to deal with. Now I want to talk a bit about this. You know, why did the angel of the Lord, why did Jesus mention those seven churches? You know there were plenty of churches. You had a church in Athens, you had a church in Corinth, you had a church in uh, uh, the Berean ones, uh, Berean. You had a church, uh, you had a church in Troas, which is a, one of the coastal city, or Corinth, uh, or no, sorry, uh, Colossae. There is a, a letter to the Colossians, and that refers to a church in Asia Minor. Why these seven? Clockwise, they're in a certain order. The postal route at the time, which was done on horseback, started from Ephesus and it went all around there. That's interesting. Because that's the order of the seven churches. And that's important that you realize that those churches have a certain order. And it has to have that. Why are some churches left out? Why are these seven mentioned? Hmm? No. No. 
Let me ask you. Let me ask you a question. See if you sometimes listen to me. I know you do. Seven is a number of. Very good. Concerning. Time. Ten. Is completion fullness numbers? Doesn't matter that less than ten, more than ten. That makes no difference. Ten means everything in Hebrew. Then you give a tithe, which is 10% of your net. Yeah? Mm -hmm. What you're saying to God, all of it belongs to you. God didn't change his mind like they do with the GST here, bumping it up to 15% before you know it. Yeah? God has never done that. Because 10% really means everything. you're saying to God, everything belongs to you. You deal with the 90% that's left as if it was his. Get it? Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Seven is concerning time. And we're going to talk a bit about that. Seven is time. If you can remember that, ten means everybody or everything. Seven is time, consecutive. Everybody? Most of the time, not always necessarily all this, but certainly seven is the number for time. Let's have a look. Let's have a look. Okay. Grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, and who is to come. Who is sending the salutation? The greeting. Who would you identify who is and was and who is to come. Jesus. I would prefer just to say God. Because when you look at that in the Greek, the one who will be. In other words, remember I those of you who come to the Monday night when we talk about the intent, ambit and purpose of the Gospel of John. He's there to prove that Jesus Christ was God. He's now talking about God. He is talking about the eternity of God. God was, He is, and always will be. Past, present, and future. Mm -hmm. You understand? Yep. He will always be. The reason why you don't have in Hebrew the verb to be in the present tense in the Hebrew, because it can only apply to God. And the personal name of God is very close to that concept. Okay. And then it goes on to say, from the seven spirits who are before his throne. What do we mean by the seven spirits? Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Leah. Did you bring anything? Not that it is important. It's in the fridge. Oh, it? good. Oh, the soup is almost gone. And from the seven churches who are before his throne. Identify this entity for me. Who would you think it was? Be mumbling. I'm just saying, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Someone might ask you and say, what does that mean? Can you explain that to me? Yes, very good. The Holy Spirit. I would have no hesitation in identifying the Holy Spirit. Have a look. Isaiah 12, the first few verses. First verse, actually. The Spirit, I want you to count with me how many qualifications there are in this statement in Isaiah 11. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding the spirit of counsel and light, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Four. Seven. Uh, Seven. The spirit of the Lord is one, spirit of wisdom two. is two, spirit of understanding three. is three, spirit of counsel is four, spirit of might is five, spirit of knowledge is six, and the fear of the Lord spirit is Seven. 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 Seven spirits. Seven. Seven qualifications. Mm -hmm. And seven means he's there all the time. He's there all the time. Mm -hmm. He is the connection. You understand? Okay. Now, have a look at this. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. witness. Now, what is the concept here 
of the faithful witness. If someone asks you, can you explain that to me? What would you say? John. No, it's Jesus Christ. He's and the faithful John's witness. The faithful witness. No, no, and of, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the antecedent, uh, okay. is Jesus Christ. Explain it to me. See if you can. Try. Well, he lived the life of God. He showed the Father to the world. Absolutely. He was, remember Philip, show us the Father. It'll be said, no, you've been with me for three years, Philip, and you still ask me? He said he's been a faithful witness from the Father to humanity. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. He is also a faithful witness in the court setting. You know, when you have a court setting, you got to have witnesses, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Now, in the, in the Hebrew law, when they have a court case, you know the one they really, really question are the witnesses. And I could talk about this for an hour and it'd be profitable. But I won't do that. But every witness was questioned. And that's the accurate. Absolutely. They were questioned before they could give evidence. And if they could would give evidence, it could not be circumstantial. They would have had to have witnessed it in person itself. And you needed two witnesses, otherwise it'd be thrown out. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It had to gel. It had to be 100%. The, the, the procedures for examination were very severe. What would happen, and I have a question here for you, and you find it in the book of Deuteronomy. What would happen to a false witness? Very good, Peter. God says in the Romani, whatever they would want to have done to th their others, you will do unto them, you I shall have no mercy. Mm -hmm. And that normally involved death. death. The death sentence. If Jesus is the true witness, then who is the false witness? Ah, and he is. He is so unlike God. Lies is head of, he's the father of lies, Jesus said. He's a false witness. What has to happen? To, what's he trying to do to you? Destroy us. Destroy you, to keep you? Away from God. Uh, in death, correct? Mm -hmm. Well, that's got to happen to him. And it will happen. The same law of that Romney will be applied to Satan. You understand? Yep. So there you are. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Is that correct? Other resurrection from the dead. Yeah, who rose from the dead? Jesus. Who, who before him? Lazarus. Huh? I don't mind that, but that was not to eternal life, was it? Moses? He died again. Moses is good. Moses, there's a little book in the Bible just Jude. before Revelation, the book of Jude, verse 9. There's an argument between Satan and Jesus because it's about the body of Moses who died some 1400 years plus before Christ. Now the interesting thing is the argument was something that Satan actually was correcting. The Lord dare not rebuke him, Satan. Why was that? Because Moses was a sinner. His salvation had not yet been dealt with, if you like. It was dependent upon the Messiah to come. And here in advance, prior to the substitutional death, Moses is resurrected to life eternal. You understand? Mm -hmm. Remember he was there on the Mount of Transfiguration? Yes. Who was the other person? Elijah. Yeah, 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 yeah very good. Uh, how about Elijah? Was he resurrected? No, no, no. no. He, he, he was translated to heaven. Very good. Okay. Give me a name of another person who was translated to heaven. Enoch. 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 Very good. Okay. 
So here's an argument. Here's an argument. Of course, once Jesus paid it all, there's no more argument, is there? No. So, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, he is not the firstborn from the dead, but he certainly is the most important one. Had he not come back from the dead, Moses will have to go back mm -hmm. to the grave. Elijah will have to return to this planet if justice is to be applied. Elijah wasn't perfect either, but what a man, what a servant of God. Amazing. And translated. Yeah. All right. And the ruler over the kings of the earth. You see, Satan claims, or claimed, the right to this planet. Book of Job. Where you come from? No. From going to and fro over the earth. In other words, I've been everywhere. I've examined everything. That's my you know, sons of God, a representative of the world. So he claims this world. Jesus even called him the prince of this world. That was his claim. Well, at Calvary, Jesus earned it back. Not that he ever gave up on it. But he certainly was fully justified of claiming the rightful rulership of this planet. So he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Yeah? Okay, that's what it is. John is affirming all of this. He's, he's the message is coming through. Who and what Jesus Christ is. Sorry, Peter. He's told of a man of the things of the Yeah, yeah. Of yeah. And he, then he now. presumed to be the vice. Yeah. yeah, okay. All right. What did I say here? Yeah, that's all right. Okay. Here we go. To him who loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. You feel like a king? Um, no. When I get my mansion, I'll feel, feel pretty good. Yeah. Does it have to be a mansion? Well, that's that's just, just a humble abode. Yeah. There's a text in the Bible that says, and we shall reign with him, and that refers to the thousand years. But it's not confined to. We have a very limited understanding, comprehension of the plans that God has for us in the future. And I'm talking about eternity. Because we are the only beings in the universe that redeemed. have been redeemed. And unfallen words will want to hear from you what it was like to be redeemed. We are a spectacle. No, no, they want to know. And so, kings and priests, what does a priest do? It's a go-between between... between yeah, mediate. We can mediate for, uh, on our own behalf. On other people's behalf, we can pray. Uh, what does a priest do? A priest uh, makes an offering, as Paul says in, in Romans 12. You make yourself an acceptable sacrifice. You understand? So, priest and kings, that's a beautiful title. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen is that amen in the Hebrew is very affirmative. Behold, ah, this is the one that I always love to read when I get the JWs. <laughs> you can't explain this one away, but they do. But you can't. Not without violating the text. Behold he, who's the he? Jesus. 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 He is coming with clouds. Angels. Yes, ah, this is getting through. <laughs> you know, when you look in the distance, billions of angels look like clouds. This spectacle is far bigger than the little atmosphere of clouds that we have. Nothing compared to that. How many eyes will see him? Okay. How can you make sure that every eye will see him? Resurrection is going to be No. That every eye will see him. That's the question. Well, the word on the earth at the time that he comes. 
Yeah. So, if he comes, sorry, can I just hop in there? Say he came 9 o'clock in the morning here. Yeah? What happened on the other side of the world? How, what time would it be there? Holland and the England? Light. Huh? Night -time. Well, the light is on this side, but not on that side. Well, it's going to be very bright at Well, it doesn't matter how bright it is. It's still dark on the other the side. From the east to the west. Meaning, meaning? Well, the goodness is going to cover the No, not goodness. Come on. He's how? Well, the bright. Now you got to understand the movement. the movement. How many people in this world will see the sun once every 24 hours? Well, Let me repeat that again. At the moment, we are, we're in day and they're in night, right? Now make it the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've been drinking. Okay, now I'm only kidding. I'm only kidding. The earth rotates. As the lightning comes from the east, Jesus is talking about the sunrise that comes from the east. So he goes around the globe. When he returns, all around the globe, there'll be no dark spots anywhere in this planet. And in 24 hours, everybody will see him. What's he going to do wonders with the sun? Let's not confuse the issue, because that really precedes it and... That's a topic that I'll deal with later on in Revelation, so I'm not going there now. What you need to understand, what you didn't understand, but should, it helps you to understand the text, mm -hmm. uh, Ria, is that the motion of Jesus, when he comes, he goes through, up in the east, and he goes around the planet, and every eye will see him. Know, that's that's important. That's so that's what a JW says, that's well, that's a spiritual eye. Nonsense. He doesn't say that. No, exactly. And I agree with you there. Sorry, darling. Yep. And I was just going to say, so some people will see him before other people will see him? Yeah, yes, yes. Yes, he'll come from the direction of north. That's from Orion. And that's just another story altogether. Maybe I'll one day will deal with that. He and, and, and he'll only come when every nation knows has been, had the chance to know we will talk about that topic, the criteria of his coming, not now, way down the track. Keep coming. Okay. He is coming with clouds, billions of angels. He did say, and all the angels with him, and every eye will see him. Every eye will see him because he goes around the globe. Even they who... Yes. Wow. Who are that? The Romans, the Roman soldiers. Who was more guilty, the Roman soldiers or the Pharisees and the Sadducees? The Jews? Oh, oh. Jesus said that to Pilate. Do you know that Pilate actually, it's not so much in the Bible, but Pilate, he really tried to set Jesus free and he sort of almost apologized. Sorry, there's nothing I can do for you. I've got to think of my own position first, really, which is which is what he was saying, and he didn't hold for very long after. Three years later, he committed suicide and with his wife. He might as well do everything together. And so, and so th the, story is, the story is that he tried to set Jesus free, but what did Jesus say to him? The one, or the ones, who delivered me up to you have the greater Guilt, it's in the Gospels. Mm -hmm. So, you but would, if the they that pierced him, the soldiers, and we're talking about and the nails and despair, they're only. In the grave. Aren't they in, they're in the grave, the ones Absolutely. I'm getting I'm, 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 I'm getting to this. I'm, getting, I'm working my way towards it. I just want to identify who we're talking about first. Okay? Let's first identify who we're talking about, and then I'll give the answer to your question. Those who pierced him, those who sent him to be pierced, cried for, out for him or, or forced Pilate to make that decision for him to be pierced. And whilst despair is the only, only accounted for in the Gospel of John, which may well link it with Revelation as the same writer, 
it's also particularly the really the nail that's piercing too, so not exclusively the spear on his side. They who pierced him, those who are guilty of the piercing, they will see him come. Now this is interesting. Have a look at this. If you go to Daniel chapter 12 verse 2, text is there. Many of those, and this is about the time when Michael stands up and, and that's the end of the probationary time and he's coming. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. Which means what? Give me one word for Resurrection. it. Resurrection. Resurrection. Some to everlasting life, good, but also some to shame and everlasting contempt. It's interesting, that fits the bill with what Revelation says, that those who were responsible and performed, not just the soldier, but everybody who played a role, those who pierced him will see the same event. That's interesting. Get it? Get it? Have a look at this one. Have a look at this one. Jesus, when he was standing before the Sanhedrin, he was giving this particular statement. Nevertheless, he said to them, I say to you, hereafter, you will see the Son of Man. Son of Man is who? Jesus. Jesus. Sitting at the right hand of the power. What does it mean, at the right hand? Yes, authority. Good one. Power is who? See, he was avoiding the term for deity to accumulate less guilt in their eyes. But they knew exactly what he was saying. And coming on the clouds of heaven, there you have that same expression. And that can be equated when he says, and all the holy angels with him. They the clouds. Daniel 7, the Son of Man, when he came with the clouds of heaven, he came to the court setting. Study the seventh chapter of the book of Daniel. You with me? Mm -hmm. You understand that? Everything fits. They're all describing the same event, the same criteria. Yeah? Good. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Now, oh, <laughs> this is heavy language. All the tribes of the earth is a designated term for those who have not listened, mm -hmm. those who have rejected. Yeah? So those who have rejected the message, how happy will they be when they see that enormous phenomenon of power appearing? I mean, the whole planet will be an upheaval of a catastrophic nature that we have simply never seen. When that power field of all the holy angels will come to this planet, that power field will disturb the topography of this planet. No doubt about it. You have seen, we have seen nothing yet. And yet you will be safe. Wonderful, isn't it? <coughs> now all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him. Even so, amen. It is reflects the remorse of the ungodly. There's a big difference between remorse and repentance. True? Yeah. Remorse is regretting the result of your sin. Repentance is having done, performed the action of the sin and the turning away from it. And that's a process. I am the Alpha and the Omega. Where do we get that statement from? Can anybody tell me? What are they? In the end. Yeah, yeah, but uh, no. <laughs> what language are we talking about? Greek. Greek is the first and the last. The first and the last. Because this comes to us in the Greek language, you see. The beginning and the end, same thing. God is the beginning. Now, when you talk about beginning, when Jesus says, I am the beginning, some have said, oh, Jesus had a beginning. No, 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 no. In the Greek, as in the Hebrew, you have the asif, the passive, and the active tense of a verb. 
This is the active tense. The active tense here, oops, the active tense here means he is the cause of everything. You understand? He is the cause of all the angels. He is the cause for everything that exists and maintained its existence. And that is how you have to understand that word beginning. That is grammatically correct. Okay? So we are talking about the Almighty, which is Jesus. The vision of the Son of God. This is amazing. Have a look at this. I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ. Right? He's, who's he talking to? Who's he writing to? Jews. Well, it's very interesting. No, no, was it just the Jews? No, no, no. Listen, listen. Understand the setting. 70 AD, what happened? Where did all the Christians go? Dispersed. They went actually to the other side of the River Jordan, a place called Pella, and then they went up north, and you see them throughout the whole of Asia Minor. Antioch was really, in Asia Minor, was really, uh, well, a bit below Asia Minor, was really the center, if you like, of Christendom. But it was very strong in Asia Minor because who had been a, uh, uh, an apostle to all those Gentiles there? Paul. He spent an enormous time there. And John, when it was dispersed in Jerusalem, he went to Ephesus, as tradition has it, and he worked amongst the churches there. Can you imagine the one, the one that is left, the only one that's still alive, that physically worked and lived with Jesus? He and you know he encouraged them and he kept them on the straight and narrow, theologically. Do you understand? Mm -hmm. He had a tremendous influence. So so when he is on the island of Patmos, which is just off the coast of Turkey, it's still under Greek authority. The interesting thing, the interesting thing is, um, when he was released, he went back to Ephesus. And that's where he died and was buried. But he didn't think he would ever initially ever get off the island. It's interesting, it was normally a one-way trip. You're there, you're there until the day you die. Some say there were salt mines, there is no evidence for it. I think there were just quarries, and of course there was forced labor imposed. Bible doesn't mention anything. But what we have here, when you own Patmos, you stayed there. You stayed there. That was it. Until you die. You had no communication with the outside world. So why write a book? Why write a letter? Because God already knew he was going to get off the island. He was only there for less than two years. Yeah? Still a long time if you don't like the place, but there it is. For the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. Remember, I explained to you under the Mitzian what the cause was for his failed execution and ultimate banishment to the island of Patmos. You remember that? Yeah. We talked about that? Yeah. Yep. Everybody remembers that? Yeah. He's a conscious objector to the worship of the emperor. The emperor. That's right. And he's teaching that. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. A few more minutes. Seven. Seven. Yeah. But many Sunday keeping Christians will tell you that from ancient times the Lord's day means what day? Sunday. Sunday. Yeah. You go over to some of the early church fathers, they use the Lord's Day. Guess what day they're identifying? Sunday. Sunday. Let me help you. The term the Lord's Day, there are various explanations. 
Some even have said that Lord Caesar, it might have meant the day that you burned incense to Caesar. There's no way that John would have referred to that as the Lord said. He, he was in opposition to it, so forget that. Then the Sunday keeping churches say, well, it was Sunday. No, it was not. Because the earliest writing, expression of the Lord's Day, meaning Sunday, came 80 years after this. There is no record whatsoever of the Lord's Day meaning to be Sunday. Sunday was introduced in the early part of the second century AD because when the Emperor Adrian, Hadrian wanted the Jews to be banished from Jerusalem, the Christians, after their last revolt under Bar Kokhba, the Christians, the Christians wanted to be, some of them wanted to be different from the Jews. So they departed and also started to worship on the Roman day, which had to do with Mithraism, and that was a Sunday type of worship in order to be different. It was a small group. Because in 321 AD, there is an emperor by the name of Constantine the Great, or Constantine the First, who gives the blue law, meaning to rest on Sunday, the first day of the week. And that mainly applied to those in the city, not to those working in the fields. So, if the Christians had, at the instructions of Jesus and the Apostle, changed the seventh day Sabbath to Sunday, there would have been no need for Constantine to change it. And it's fascinating when you go, it is fascinating when you go to the Roman Catholic Church and you ask him, who changed it? You know what the answer is? We did. We did. And they're right. The 6th, 7th century AD, they enforced it and became very aggressive towards those who still clung to a seventh day Sabbath worship. Oh, they, they, many have there been that have been imprisoned, tortured, and killed, and defrauded, and dispossessed because they kept the seventh day Sabbath. It's for the record. Do you understand that? Okay. I was on the Spirit in the Lord's day. Now let me explain this. Therefore, the Son of Man is also the Lord of the Sabbath. That makes it the Lord's Day. Would you agree with me? Yes. In fact, I, I think you can't make anything else of it. And I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. He hears a loud voice behind him. Now, I don't know. Have you ever had anybody call your name and they're behind you? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah? So what do you do? Turn around. Okay. It's very different when you hear it in front of you. Because it's audiovisual instant. Yeah? If someone, oi, suddenly comes to you. Now the voice here is like the voice of a trumpet. And so I think it was a softer approach. Because when we look at the visual that we're going to be having, it was quite a bit to take into, John. I think Jesus, who appears and speaks here, is gently, in a sense, reappearing to his beloved disciples some 64 years since he left to go to heaven. Do you understand? And he doesn't look the same, but he looks human because he still has retained his humanity. So he heard a loud voice saying, I am the Alpha, the Omega, there you have it again, the first of the last, that is the first and the last letter of the alphabet, Meaning, you know, the beginning and the end, same thing. What you see right in a book. In other words, what you see, it's audio visual. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. And here we are again, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And next week we're going to start looking at those. Because these churches were selected 
that some of the conditions that prevailed in those churches at that time would be prevailing in the Christian churches throughout the Christian era right unto the time of the end. That's why these seven were selected. Because it had to have an application there and then and an application in the future. Are you with me? Did everybody get that? Fantastic. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me and having turned I saw seven golden lampstands. What makes the biggest impression upon him are the seven golden lampstands. Now gold is perfection. Lampstands, light. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man being Jesus. Jesus. He is there. Clothed with a garment down to the feet, girded about the chest with a golden band. Uh, the picture is not quite correct. His head and hair were white as snow, uh, like wool and as white as snow. Why is he saying that? Well, he sees a brightness in this person that is so unreal, but real, it's there. He cannot find the words to give expression to it. So the best he can come up with, white wool and snow. What's whiter? Nothing. Okay, nothing. Um, his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass as refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. The loudest noise you would hear on that island would be the water, as it thumped against the rocks. Now, this expression here, can you mention to me where we would find another description like that well before the book of Revelation? Daniel. Daniel. Very good. Daniel 7. The Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? God, God who? Father. The Father. Because they are alike, you understand? Yeah, there you are. Okay, very good. Very good. He had in his right hand the seven stars. Makes me think of a, a text in Job. And, and, and the morning stars were singing for joy at the laying of the foundation. Who are they? angels of course he had in his right hand seven stars what's the word of angels angelos here in the Greek uh, yeah. out of his mouth went a sharp two edged sword <coughs> oh that wouldn't be pretty but what does it mean we have a physical figure of a spiritual <coughs> truth what would you Bible? What, have? Bible? It's the word of God. It cuts through bone and marrow. It separates them, Paul says. I like that expression. And a double-edged sword, which probably goes back to the 3rd century BC, there was an early judge who was fighting with the Moabite. The Moabite king by the name of Eglon was killed with a two-edged sword. What was the name of that early judge? And you find it in the book of Judges, just in case. He was quite fat. That's right. That's right, Peter. You've got the story. What was the name of the guy? What was the name of the guy who did that? Yeah. Okay. I should have put money on this. Ehud. Yeah, he's doing well. Ehud. Yeah. Ehud. Yeah, yeah, because it just, it, it, yes, yeah, very gory, isn't it? I know, I know, okay. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. You find that expression also about the man that appeared to Mrs. Manoah. Manoah, the father of Samson. Samson, shining. That's what it means, bright. That's where the name comes from. That was the same person that appeared almost, well, more than a thousand years, about 11, 11 and a half centuries before, probably 12 by the time of writing, to Mrs. Manoah. 
We don't know a name. We only know the name of Manoah. Not fair, but that's the way it is. Almost there. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Can you think of any instances when people are feeling absolutely paralyzed? When they have what is called a theophany, a, a, a vision of God or an, a heavenly being. Who? Moses had this shining face and, and, and the people asked him to cover his face. He did, it had rubbed off. The, the, the brilliance when he was in the presence of God. So Isaiah, oh, Isaiah felt totally, totally unworthy. Who virtually collapsed and the angel had to pull him up on his hands and his knees? Daniel. 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 Yeah, Daniel. Very good. So it really apparently takes away all your power. And, and he had laid his right hand on me saying to me, do not be afraid. You find that expression many times. Angels say that. I am the first and the last. This is Jesus. I am he who lives, was dead, and behold, I am for life evermore. And I have the keys of hate and death. What does that mean? Yes. Yes, it means the keys are a symbol of power and jurisdiction. I have now all authority in heaven and earth. Isn't that what he said just before he went to heaven? When he blessed his disciples to become apostles. Absolutely, absolutely. Write the things which you have seen, the things which are, the things which will take place after this. And then a quick explanation. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand are, and the seven golden lampstands. Well, the seven stars are the angels, the messengers the to the seven churches. churches. Okay? That's what they are. Now you have your answer to that. That's what they are. And the seven lampstands, which you saw, are the seven churches. Okay. You've got it. I mean, the Bible interprets itself every single time. Okay. That was the end of the presentation. Thank you so much for it. You can't go back once you switch off, do you? Thank you, Barry. Thank a you. pleasure, a pleasure. And um, that's it. Any questions? Can we bow our heads? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you have given us to study your word, to learn once again the wonderful provisions that you have made for us to know you and to be aware and in the full knowledge of the work of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary above. Lord, we pray that we may retain the information, that we will use it in order to help other people also to understand. Lord, we pray for the refreshments that we have, and we also pray, of course, for traveling mercies as we find our way home tonight. And that you bring us together again for further worship and study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.